Today we have a crazy high school nuclear revenge story. We'll get into that in a bit, but first, I don't feel a bit sorry for Daniel. Basketball is just a game, they said. At least that was what I thought. Being in my high school basketball team has been a dream I've had for as far as when I made my first hoop. I grew to love the game when I was in middle school. Watching the highlights of the great Chicago Bulls was how I ended my day. I was usually up until midnight watching clips of Michael Jordan. This had a great impact on my game at a young age, to the extent that I started sticking my tongue out when going for a layup like Michael Jordan did. I had a friend, Daniel, and like me, he was a big fan of basketball. Daniel and I have been friends since we were in kindergarten. It's safe to say we started our schooling journey together. We became closer as we grew older. Since then, we became brothers, basically. We did basically everything together, from talent shows to parties, you name it. We enjoyed each other's company and it made us inseparable. My parents were well aware of Daniel because we were usually at one another's house after school. We both had a garage with a basketball board and net. His house basically felt like home to me. I'm always stating the fact that I'm a bit envious of his height. I wasn't as tall as he was. He also always stated the fact that he was taller than I am. We weren't geniuses in school, but we didn't fail classes. We took the same classes. Yes, we were that close. I usually tried my best not to get in fights, but Daniel was the arrogant type. He never lets anything slide. Even though he'll always get beat up and I'll have to save his butt, he never backs down from a fight. I nicknamed him the Big Baby because even with his large body frame, he still fusses when the slightest happens to him. This particular day, we went to try the public basketball court, or as they call it, playground. This is where the best players come to have fun. We were considered rookies. They called us new blood after only seeing us for the first time. The fun fact is that I played very well, and Daniel, not so much. I noticed this coldness towards me on our way home, but I'm fond of Daniel. I didn't take it as anything. Our friendship seemed to be deteriorating, but something always brought us together, basketball. It was no mystery that I was a better player than Daniel, well, at least a better shooter of the ball. Daniel was a more physical player compared to me. Making it to our local middle school team was not a problem for us. We were the best players on the team. We basically carried the team. Our chemistry was on a different level, especially when we were in the zone. It felt like nothing was real because we made it look so easy. Daniel was more of a player that drove into the paint due to his height making layups cheap for him. He was the tallest on the team. He had physicality while I had better skill. We complement each other in every way. His favorite player was Dennis Rodman. It was safe to say that they played alike. He was like Dennis in a lot of ways with his play style and attitude. Daniel was the kind of guy that did not care about what other people thought. He only seemed to care about what he thought of the situation. The end of middle school was approaching and we've always had the dream of going to Molyneux High. Our grades were okay, so it was feasible. Molyneux High had one of the best basketball programs in the state. That was what attracted us the most. We've gone to games where Molyneux played, and I could say for a fact, they are almost college basketball standards. Yes, they are that good. I knew high school was going to be a very different experience compared to the small corners of middle school, so I got myself prepared for what was to come. Daniel and I usually had conversations about how high school was going to be. We always ended up concluding that we'll cross that bridge in due time. Middle school graduation drew closer, the greater the anxiety I felt. It was happening so fast. Daniel and I applied to attend Molyneux. Lucky for us, we both got accepted into the school. We were filled with joy. My parents were also happy because they knew how much going to the school meant to me. It was a dream come true, at least part of my dreams. I've always wanted to be a starting point guard. The preceding point guards for the school have all gone on to play college basketball. Some even made it into the NBA, so it was a big deal. The night before my first day was different. I could barely sleep. I was filled with excitement and anxiety at the same time, thinking about how this new experience will be. My mom noticed how uneasy I was. She knocked on the door and talked to me and she said, Don't worry, I know how you feel. We've all felt this way before. I somehow found those words comforting. I had a bit of sleep. I woke up to grab the day by its horns. I ate breakfast and got in my mom's car. She drove me to school. Before my eyes, a new chapter of my life was opened. Still nervous, I walked down the hallway looking at the cool boys and girls, wanting to have that kind of confidence. And then came Daniel. At that time, he was my knight in shining armor. 
We ran towards each other looking absolutely lost. There was light at the end of the tunnel after all. I almost forgot Daniel and I were in this together. Seeing a familiar face made it bearable. Weeks went by and I was starting to settle into the high school system. Daniel and I were not taking the same classes like we were in middle school. We still hung out after school. I usually waited for him at the entrance of the cafeteria. Tides changed when Daniel started coming late to where we met and I started noticing we didn't hang out as much. Was our friendship coming to its end? I asked myself. What will I do without him? I asked myself again. Some days Daniel didn't show up where we usually met. He usually apologizes, but sometimes your words might say something and your actions something different. I noticed he started moving with the school bully's click. Because of his big body frame, it was easy for him to fit into their category. I felt the slow deterioration of our long friendship. The funny part is he always comes back to me after he has an argument with his new friends. Daniel kept assuring me that it was not what I thought it was, that the guys just have a bad reputation. My naive self decided to believe what he said, deciding not to judge a book by its cover. Shortly after, my relationship with Daniel went through a radical change after I found H in his locker. We both had keys to our respective lockers, being best friends and all. The very day I found the H in his locker, I decided to confront Daniel. I can say for a fact that the confrontation did not go well. Having yelled at me, he collected the key he gave me to his locker and we broke our friendship off. It all felt so sudden to me, though he had been drifting for a while now. I started feeling a new form of loneliness I've never felt before. My parents, especially my mom, were worried that she had me speak to a therapist. I always said, I'm okay, to avoid further explanation, and I knew very much that I wasn't. This situation led to me doing badly in class because Daniel and I had always been study buddies as I'd like to call it. Everything felt new to me. It felt like I'd been in a protective bubble for a long while and all of a sudden it popped. Weeks went by and I started picking myself up. I'll always run into Daniel in the hallway but we won't say a word to each other. I started seeing life and high school in a different way. I started taking after school tutorials because I was lagging behind having to juggle basketball, school, and the situation with Daniel. I started feeling good a very long while when the basketball tryouts began. I knew it was inevitable not to meet Daniel at the tryouts. I was prepared to compete with anyone, even Daniel. As the days drew nearer, I put myself through intense drills just to be fit for tryouts. The coach of the basketball team, Mr. Carter, was a very disciplined man and a strict coach. He was known for putting his players through the hardest drills. During my personal preparation, I felt closer to myself than ever. There was something brewing up inside me. I became stronger both physically and mentally. I didn't want anything to get in the way of achieving my goal. I was laser focused on making the team. I knew I had to prepare more than anyone else because I wanted to be the best. I always want to be the best at what I do. I've always had the policy of being the best at whatever I do. There were three phases to the tryouts. Little did I know that the ranking was made public. I saw the list of the players that applied for the tryouts, and there it was, right under my name, was Daniels. Unbelievable, I said to myself. This means we'll be seeing a lot of each other on the court. I prepared myself for something like this. It felt like the universe had something to do with it, because out of the 49 other applicants, it just had to be Daniel. I was in for the ride. The tryouts began with endurance tests, as I expected, Daniel excelled much at that. I also spent the last month building my body and my endurance. Daniel came first in that phase like I expected. I came second, having pushed myself to the limit. I wasn't surprised, I trained myself for that. I saw the surprise in Daniel's eyes. He knew that used to be the weakest aspect of my game. Coach Carter started noticing me. I got his nod of approval after the first phase. The second phase involved shooting drills. I was excited for this because this was where I took pride in. I held the scoring record for my middle school. I'm sure Daniel knew what to expect and I can say for a fact, I was the best at shooting on the court. Having made 75% of my shots, I ranked first in that phase. The current point guard walked up to me and asked where I learned to shoot like that. I replied, practice. With a light smile on his face, he said, well done. I got the nod from the coach again. I realized the coach was taking a liking to me. I was filled with excitement. 
I'm afraid I couldn't say that about Daniel. He came fourth in that round. Shooting was never his best attribute. We were told to go home and get rested for the final phase. I hurriedly took my bath and left for the gym for my home. I got home and told my mom how the day went. She was so excited. I was sure it's not because of what I was telling her, but because she could see me smile so genuinely again. I was so excited for the next day because I knew it was going to be packed with fun. I woke up sore from the training, but I felt more energetic than ever. A great day awaits, I said to myself. Upon arriving in school, little did I know that I became popular amongst the freshmen. I kept getting nods from my classmates and some of the seniors. Maybe high school isn't so bad after all. I had three classes that day before the final phase of the tryouts. One of the three classes was history, which I took with Daniel. Our seats weren't far from each other. Upon entering the class, I could feel the strong gaze from Daniel. We stared at each other for about five seconds before I took my seat. This is war, I whispered to myself silently. There was every possibility we could make the team together because we played different positions. But I decided to look at my problem at hand and not worry about that. I anticipated the end of class so I could get changed and go to gym for the final phase of the tryouts. The sound of the bell was music to my ears. I left the class with excitement waiting to see what awaits me at the gym. I arrived at the gym, Daniel was already there. The coach welcomed me and said, only the top 10 are left on the court. I was surprised a lot of people have been cut in a very short time. Coach Carter is a very adventurous man. He told us we were going to play in a team of five. I had no idea what the final phase was. I sighed in disgust because I knew what was coming. I knew I either played with Daniel or I played against Daniel. Either way, we had to cross paths on the court. The coach rolled up 10 pieces of paper and told all of us to pick from it. I dipped my hand in the bowl and expected what I picked. Yes, I was on his team. A dark cloud was hovering over such a good day. I had no choice but to oblige with the coach, even if it meant speaking to Daniel. I wasn't comfortable, but I loved basketball compared to a mere beef with my ex-friend. I rallied the team and told them to play like it's an actual competitive game. We had to win the game in order to be selected. I was nervous. This was the game of my life up until now. We started on the front foot, mostly thanks to me. I made four three-point shots, giving us a five-point lead. Then came the twist in the tail, as I expected. Daniel wanted to be the starting man. He kept holding the ball, trying to make points for himself. He made some, but most times he turned the ball over to the opponent, leading to points made by the opponent. I was filled with rage. I walked up to him and told him to play a team game. I told him, we won't win if he keeps playing like this. You're not the coach, he replied. I walked away with fury. We won the game, luckily. Coach Carter congratulated us personally. He walked up to me and said, welcome to the team. This was a dream come true for me. Then I remembered I had to be on the team with Daniel. I felt a short wave of rage. I packed my bags and went home. I got to school the next day, getting even more popular for making the team as a freshman. I had to get back to academic reality. I was failing some classes. I had to take an extra tutorial, making me leave the school as late as 8 p.m. I usually get home tired and exhausted. One disastrous night, I saw Daniel walk up to me in the middle of an alley saying to me, you have nowhere to run. I told him to leave me alone, that I wasn't ready for his little stunt. After that, I walked past him. There, I saw his group of bully friends. I tried to run, but both entrances were blocked. I got beat so badly that I had to be hospitalized for two weeks. I was so lucky I didn't get a bone fracture, but I had to wear a cast on my arm for three weeks. My mom kept asking me if I saw anything that happened. I kept telling her it happened so fast that I couldn't see anything. She knew I was lying, and yes, I was lying. I wanted to take matters into my hands. I was so furious that I kept plotting and thinking of how I can get back at Daniel. Then it struck me that I found H in his locker. I knew he was using. Having known Daniel for so long, I knew where he would go and take something like that. I knew he couldn't do it during school hours. I knew it would be after school. I made that my plan the first day I got back to school. I had no idea jealousy could make Daniel so toxic. We both made the team, I asked myself. What could make him jealous, I asked. Then I remembered I outperformed him in the third phase of the tryouts. That wasn't enough reason to beat me up. 
When I went back to school, I was welcomed warmly by my teammates and classmates. I patiently waited for the day to end. I had a plan. I inconspicuously trailed Daniel to where he met with his friends. I was so surprised with what I saw. I was piping the wooden window. It was Daniel using steroids. I looked in disbelief. I reached for my pocket quickly and brought out my cell phone to record what I just saw. I took a video and sent it to Coach Carter and the entire class. I made sure to send the video from an unknown number, making it untraceable back to me. I saw Daniel's life take a very bad turn. He got kicked off the basketball team. He then got expelled from school after board review. I felt bad for him at some point, but anytime I remember I was badly beaten, I always come to a conclusion that he deserved what came to him. I went on to make my home debut. I came off the bench and scored 25 points and made 7 assists, setting the record for most point contribution made by a freshman. I mean, even beyond the rivalry or jealousy that he displayed here, he was already very clearly on the fast track to ruining his life. I mean, to be honest, outing him was maybe a responsible thing for OP, maybe they'll get some help. That said, our next story is, the greatest gift of revenge I gave my high school. Remember your first day in high school when you feel like nothing could go wrong and after topping the class in middle school, you're sure you'll do well? Well, this was my initial feeling when I was to resume at Montgomery High School in the fall. Before this, I had no experience with high school except for my love for movies and TV shows. I'm the only child of my parents and my friends are all in the same grade as I am. The anticipation leading up to my first day of sophomore year was palpable. Fresh notebooks, sharpened pencils, and a renewed determination fueled my excitement. My achievements in middle school had set the bar high, creating an image of success that had yet to meet the challenges of high school. As I stepped onto the campus of Montgomery High School, my heart raced with a mix of hope and anxiety. The halls were a maze of unfamiliar faces, each one a potential friend or foe. My small circle of friends from middle school provided a familiar refuge amidst the sea of new experiences. However, little did I know that the tranquility of my past would soon be replaced by a storm of torment that would test the very essence of my being. The first few weeks went by in a blur of introductions, new classes, and adjusting to the rigorous pace of high school. I felt like a small fish in a vast ocean, struggling to find my place. My friends and I stuck together navigating the hallways like a tight-knit unit. We shared stories of our teachers, compared class schedules, and discussed the exciting events that lay ahead. One day during lunch, as we sat in our usual spot in the courtyard, I noticed a group of students gathered near the bulletin board. Their animated gestures and excited whispers piqued my curiosity. I excused myself from my friends and made my way over to see what had captured their attention. Pinned to the board was a colorful poster announcing auditions for the school's upcoming theater production. A rush of excitement surged through me as I read the details. Being a fan of movies and TV shows, I'd always secretly harbored a desire to perform on stage, to become someone else, if only for a brief moment. That evening, as I shared the news with my friends, their faces lit up with excitement. You should totally go for it, Sarah, my best friend exclaimed her eyes shining with encouragement. The idea of stepping out of my comfort zone both thrilled and terrified me. But with their unwavering support, I decided to take the plunge and audition for the play. The days leading up to the audition were filled with a whirlwind of emotions. I practiced monologues in front of the mirror, rehearsed lines with my friends, and even dreamt about being on stage. As the audition day dawned, my heart raced and my palms grew clammy but I was determined to conquer my fears and make my mark. The audition room was filled with an air of nervous anticipation as I stood before the casting panel. My voice trembled slightly as I delivered my lines, but I poured my heart and soul into the performance. When I finished, I looked up to see the panel exchanging glances and nodding approvingly. A sense of accomplishment washed over me, regardless of the outcome. Days turned into weeks, and the wait for the casting results felt like an eternity. In the meantime, the challenges of the school year continued to mount. The coursework became more demanding and the pressure to maintain the high standards I'd set for myself began to weigh heavily on my shoulders. The once familiar hallways now seemed daunting and the faces that held the promise of friendship began to blur together. Then, one afternoon, as I sat in the cafeteria with my friends, I received an unexpected email notification on my phone. 
My heart raced as I opened the message and my eyes scanned the words before me. Congratulations! You've been cast in the role of Emily in our upcoming production. Tears of joy welled up in my eyes as I shared the news with my friends. They erupted into cheers and congratulatory hugs, and I felt an overwhelming sense of belonging at that moment. The audition had not only given me a chance to pursue my passion, but it also brought me closer to my friends, strengthening our bond in the face of adversity. As rehearsals began, newfound energy filled my days. I embraced the challenges of balancing schoolwork with rehearsals, and the camaraderie among the cast members made the experience even more rewarding. The storm of torment that had clouded my initial days in Montgomery High School began to dissipate, replaced by a sense of purpose and accomplishment. Then, the sophomore year began like any other chapter in my life, filled with anticipation and hope for new experiences. I was a quiet girl who found solace in the pages of books and had a penchant for the unconventional. Little did I know, this very uniqueness would become a target for torment. The first few weeks went by smoothly as I navigated my classes and began to find my footing. But then, like an unexpected thunderclap on a clear day, the torment began. Sophia and Emily emerged as the architects of my misery their cruel intentions evident in every malicious glance and taunting word. It started with whispers, subtle remarks that cut through the air like a knife. I would catch fragments of their conversations, the sharpness of their words punctuating the ordinary hum of the classroom. At first, I brushed off their comments, hoping they would lose interest and move on, but their cruelty only intensified, escalating from words to actions that left me bruised both physically and emotionally. The stairwell, once a quiet sanctuary, became a chamber of torment at the hands of Sophia and Emily. The pins they used as instruments of pain were a manifestation of their malicious intent, piercing my flesh and leaving behind scars that would forever bear witness to their cruelty. Each encounter left me shaken, my self-confidence eroded with every blow. Desperation led me to confide in a teacher hoping that the adults entrusted with our care would intervene and put an end to the torment. But the response I received was a harsh reality check. My pleas were met with skepticism and denial. The very people meant to protect me turned a blind eye, their indifference compounding the pain that had taken root in my heart. The torment continued, relentless in its pursuit of breaking my spirit. Their taunts echoed in my mind long after the bell had rung poisoning even the moments of respite I found within the pages of my beloved books. It was as if they had claimed ownership of my existence, their cruelty defining the narrative of my high school experience. As the days turned into weeks and then months, the weight of their torment began to take its toll. My once bright eyes now carried a shadow of fear, and the confident stride that had marked my entry into Montgomery High School had been replaced by a cautious shuffle. I withdrew from the activities that had once brought me joy, my passion for the theater dampened by the darkness that had enveloped my world. One evening, as I sat alone in my room, my eyes fell upon the poster that had once ignited my dreams of performing on stage. The memory of the auditions, the thrill of being cast, and the camaraderie of the cast members flooded my thoughts. For a brief moment, the weight of my torment seemed to lift, replaced by a spark of determination that had lain dormant within me. With newfound resolve, I reached out to my castmates, sharing my struggles and seeking their support. To my surprise, they embraced me with open arms, their empathy and kindness a stark contrast to the cruelty I had endured. Together, we formed a bond that transcended the confines of the stage, and as we rehearsed and prepared for the upcoming production, I found a renewed sense of purpose. Opening night arrived, and as I stood backstage, my heart raced with a mix of anticipation and nervous energy. The once familiar jitters that had plagued me seemed insignificant compared to the battles I'd fought off stage. As the curtains rose and I stepped into the spotlight, a sense of empowerment washed over me. With every line I delivered, I felt the weight of Sophia and Emily's torment lessen, replaced by a newfound confidence that had been born from the depths of my struggles. The applause that echoed through the theater at the end of the performance was more than just validation of my acting skills. It was a testament to my resilience and the triumph of the human spirit over adversity. The torment that had once defined my high school experience had been transformed into a source of strength, a reminder that even in the face of cruelty one could rise above and reclaim their identity. 
In the aftermath of the play's success, Sophia and Emily's power over me began to wane, or so I thought. Their taunts and actions lost their sting as I found solace in my passions and the unwavering support of my friends. The scars they had left behind became symbols of my strength rather than reminders of my pain. Days turned into weeks and the torment continued unabated. Each encounter left me more defeated, my spirit eroded by their relentless cruelty. They reveled in my misery, their taunts echoing in my mind long after the final bell had rung. It was as if my very existence had become a canvas upon which they painted their sadistic desires. I knew I had to do something, but I just couldn't figure out how to go about shaking off my bullies, and it seemed like I'd had to make Sophia, the head in all this, pay for all the sufferings they'd made me go through. Then fate, it seemed, had a plan of its own. A chance encounter led me to a new ice cream shop that promised relief from the heat of summer. As I entered, I froze, my heart pounding in my chest. There behind the counter stood Sophia, her eyes widening in recognition before a devious smirk graced her lips. It was as if the universe had conspired to deliver her into my hands. A daring idea blossomed in my mind, fueled by the desperation for retribution. I ordered a dairy and gluten-free ice cream, fully aware of my allergies, setting up my phone camera to capture every moment. I watched as Sophia prepared my order. The smirk she wore was all the confirmation I needed. She intended to strike once again. My heart raced as I held my breath, the camera recording her every move. And then it happened. A spoonful of milk, deliberately concealed beneath the facade of ice cream, tainted my treat. Gluten-containing wafers crumbled over the top, a final touch to her malevolent creation. With practiced ease, she presented it to me, her voice dripping with false sweetness. The trap was set, and I was ready to spring it. Maintaining my composure, I thanked her and calmly requested to speak with the owner. As the shop owner listened to my account and watched the damning footage, a mixture of shock and anger played across her face. In that moment, justice felt within reach a lifeline for the torment I had endured. The wheels of consequence were set in motion, and Sophia's web of deceit began to unravel. In the aftermath, Sophia faced the consequences of her actions. Her role as an instigator of suffering was exposed, and her ambitions were dashed against the rocks of justice. The very act that had once broken my spirit had become the catalyst for her own downfall. She would forever carry the weight of her choices, a reminder that cruelty reaps its own bitter harvest. The passage of time saw me grow in ways I'd never anticipated. The quiet girl who had once sought refuge in the pages of books now stood taller, her shoulders squared with newfound confidence. The echoes of Sophia's cruelty had faded, replaced by a resolve to rise above the shadows that had once threatened to engulf me. As news of Sophia's actions spread throughout the school, a shift occurred in the dynamics. The whispers that once followed me down the hallways were now directed at her, a bitter reminder of the consequences she could not escape. It was a small victory, a taste of the vindication I'd longed for, and yet the satisfaction I felt was tempered by the knowledge that Sophia's punishment was only the beginning. The incident had ignited a fire within me, a hunger for justice that burned with an intensity I had never known. Inspired by my own experience, I sought ways to raise awareness about the devastating effects of bullying. With the support of my friends, I organized workshops and seminars, inviting experts to speak about the psychological and emotional toll that bullying inflicts upon its victims. The response was overwhelming. Students, who had once suffered in silence, now found solace in sharing their stories. Together, we forged a bond that transcended the walls of our school, uniting us in our determination to create change. It was a testament to the power of turning adversity into action, of using our pain to fuel a movement that could reshape the very fabric of our community. The local media caught wind of our efforts, shining a spotlight on the cause we had taken up. Interviews and articles highlighted the transformation that had taken place within the once quiet girl who had faced her tormentor head on. I found myself at the center of a whirlwind a reluctant spokesperson for a cause that had become my life's mission. In the midst of the chaos, one message stood out, an email from a stranger who had stumbled upon our campaign. The subject line simply read, Your story gave me hope. As I read the heartfelt words of gratitude, tears welled up in my eyes. 
it was a poignant remember that our actions, no matter how small, have the power to resonate far beyond our immediate reach. The following year, as I prepared to graduate from Montgomery High School, I reflected on the journey that had brought me to this point. The scars of my past had become a badge of honor, a reminder of the battles I'd fought and the victories I'd achieved. Sophia's reign of terror had been replaced by a legacy of resilience, one that had ignited a spark of change within our community. As I walked across the stage to receive my diploma, I felt a sense of closure wash over me. The halls that had once echoed with cruelty now reverberated with the promise of a brighter future. And though Sophia's name had faded into obscurity, her impact remained. A reminder that even in the face of darkness, we have the power to shape our own destinies. And so, my high school journey came to an end, not as a victim of bullying, but as a survivor who would turn the tide against her tormentor. The story of Sophia and me had evolved into a narrative of empowerment, a testament to the resilience of the human spirit. As I stepped out into the world beyond, I carried with me the lessons I'd learned, that strength can be found in vulnerability, that justice can arise from adversity, and that the power to create change resides within us all. As the years went by, the impact of our anti-bullying campaign continued to reverberate. Schools in neighboring towns adopted our workshops, and community organizations rallied behind our cause. I found myself speaking at conferences, sharing my story with audiences far and wide. The girl who had once been silenced by torment had now become a voice for those who had been marginalized and unheard. In college, I pursued a degree in psychology driven by a desire to understand the complexities of human behavior and to help others heal from the scars of their own pasts. The lessons of resilience and compassion I'd learned during my high school years became the foundation upon which I built my future. As I delved deeper into my studies, I realized that the torment I'd faced was not an isolated incident. Bullying was a pervasive issue that transcended age, gender and socioeconomic status. My research and advocacy work only solidified my commitment to eradicating this epidemic. Years later, as I stood before a podium at a national conference, addressing an audience of educators, parents and students, I couldn't help but reflect on the journey that had led me there. The quiet girl who had once felt powerless in the face of cruelty had become a force for change, a living testament to the resilience of the human spirit. The legacy of our campaign had evolved into a movement that spanned generations. Students across the country were empowered to stand up against bullying, armed with the knowledge that their voices could make a difference. The very halls that had once been a breeding ground for torment had transformed into spaces of empathy and understanding. Looking out into the crowd, I saw faces that mirrored the pain I'd once felt, and yet their eyes held a glimmer of hope. A spark ignited by the stories of survival and triumph that had been shared. As I concluded my speech, I felt a deep sense of gratitude for the journey I'd undertaken, for the scars that had become symbols of strength, and for the opportunity to be a catalyst for change. As applause filled the room, I knew that the story of my high school years had transcended the confines of a single chapter in my life. It had become a narrative of transformation, a testament to the resilience of the human spirit, and a reminder that even in the darkest of times, there's a light that can guide us forward. And as I stepped down from the podium, I carried with me the unwavering belief that our collective actions have the power to shape a world where empathy triumphs over cruelty and where every voice is heard and valued. I think more than anything, the most inspirational thing of OP's story here is the fact that even when you're in a dark place or you're at a disadvantaged place or you're treated badly, it can be a catalyst to make that person actually create not only the change that they need, but such a lasting effect in their lives that they go on to try to help other people and do help other people. How much do you want to bet at that graduation speech that there were some parents with tears in their eyes from what OP was talking about? But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. Now, if you want to hear another absolutely crazy story of revenge, check out that video on the left. Or if you missed my latest video, check out that video on the right. That said, I'll see you all next time with some more stories.